Nuclear is a community-powered scanner that can scan for almost every web-based vulnerability. But how does it work and how can you tailor it to your needs? Stay tuned to find out. But first, a message from our sponsor, Datadog. Datadog's cloud security platform detects threats in real time across your full stream of ingested data. You can easily get started with default detection rules that map to the MITRE attack framework and other compliance standards. For more flexibility, you can write custom rules right in the UI, no query language required. The cloud security platform also tracks your compliance posture alongside other security threats. And expert-built dashboards offer immediate visibility into threats and trends. 500 plus out-of-the-box integrations give you security insights in minutes. You can now view and correlate all your data in a unified platform that brings together DevOps and security teams. Sign up for a free trial of Datadoc today and receive free swag. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's show. Today's guest is Rob, also known as Pink Draconian. Pink Draconian works as a hacker manager at Integrity, a bug bounty platform, and also runs his own YouTube channel. Welcome to the show, Rob. Hello, hello. I am so happy to be here. Uh, very glad that I got invited to come and talk about a tool that I love a lot. Now, a lot of people also don't like it or, or haven't experienced it, but today I will convince you that this tool is amazing. And obviously I am talking about Nuclei. Uh, so yeah, that's what we're going to be covering today. I hope you're very excited for it. I also hope that there will be questions in the chat because I, I love a bit of interaction. So be sure to ask any questions and then I'll try to get them answered. Uh, but yeah. Without further ado, let's get into it. Um, so first things first here, Nuclei, and, and the little caption below that is hunting down every single vulnerability. And I mean that. Nuclei can practically find every single uh, web-based vulnerability, but also outside of the web environment. And yeah, let's, let's go into why and how Nuclei does that. But first of all, uh, I already had a great introduction here but just a little bit. So I am Pink Dragonian. I'm Hacker Manager at Integrity, uh, but I also make a bunch of security content on YouTube. Like right now, I'm running a course where we're going through binary exploitation from the beginning. So from assembly, going all the way through to the more, more advanced topics in binary exploitation, but also a ton of other stuff, including web content. I also play a lot of CTFs and I like to do some bug bounty hunting because that is what Integrity is. We're a bug bounty platform but a little bit more on that later. For now, let's talk about Nuclei. What is Nuclei? How can we use it? Uh, and yeah, where, what are their, its strengths and what are its weaknesses? Well, first of all, Nuclei is uh, created by Project Discovery uh, and it's fully open source. So it's, it's an open source tool. It's community powered, it's template based, it's fast and efficient, and it's a vulnerability scanner. And those are a lot of words and maybe some buzzwords so yeah, let's get into all of those. So first of all, Nuclei is a vulnerability scanner. That means that you give it a list of targets. Uh, these can be endpoints, uh, subdomains, host names, whatever. You give them to Nuclei and Nuclei is going to scan them for a set of vulnerabilities. And it's then gonna come back to you and say, okay, I found this vulnerability or I found this informational thing. And on a screenshot below, for example, um, we can see that it did some detecting here. It didn't find a vulnerability, but it, it detected that PHP my admin is on there, that PHP is being used, that Apache is being used, and so on. So that's already a lot of valuable information. But on top of that, it can also scan for vulnerabilities, uh, things that you might miss that are simple to miss. A very simple example here is um, it can scan for a .git um, .git folder that's open that's leaking your source code. Very, very simple example of something that could be forgotten that Nuclei will definitely find for you. But okay, it's a vulnerability scanner. That's that's all very cool, but it's also open source. So you can find the source code at, at on GitHub. And, and I really like that a project like this is open source because you have a lot of closed source solutions for a lot of various different things. But this community, this, this hacking community, 
we're sharing so much with each other and by having such a great and powerful tool like Nuclei, like Nuclei open source, I think that that's a really important thing for this community that we should keep on doing, keep on making tools, sharing them with the community in the same way that I'm uh, making videos and sharing them with the community. So if you ever uh, want a cool project to work on, want to get some experience in development or in anything else, uh, definitely go look into open source, see where you can help and, and maybe Nuclei can be a project uh, where you could help. So, okay, it's open source and it's a vulnerability scanner, but it's also community powered. Now, what does that mean? Well, uh, Nuclei is written and created by the community. Nuclei itself uh, cannot really do anything. Nuclei runs on templates and those templates are created by the community. And currently over 400 uh, contributors have already contributed their templates, contributed different scans for different vulnerabilities. And that is something that I really, really admire. And this is another place where you could chime in. So if you find a CVE or if you see that something isn't being currently being detected by Nuclei, just go and create a, a template. And we will talk a lot about those templates and about how you can create them later. But create one and submit it uh, so that everybody else can use it and that, so that the world can become a safer place. Nuclei, like I said, is also template based. So that means that Nuclei itself cannot really do anything. It needs information to run these scans. And those, that information is presented in a template. And here we see an example. So it's a, it's a YAML uh, template, which pretty much just says, and in this case, it, it starts with an ID and some info about the author, the name. So in this case, it's an Amazon secret token that is being looked for, I guess. Um, and then we have the request, and this is what Nuclei is going to do. So in this case, Nuclei is going to make a request, a get request to uh, just the URL that's given. So that's uh, one of your targets. And it's then gonna have an extractor, which is gonna extract something from that request. So it's gonna find a regex in the body. And the specific regex here is that long string, uh, which turns out to be a regex for finding, uh, for an Amazon secret token. So uh, you can just run that on all of your targets. And if any of your targets in that request returns an Amazon token, you will be notified of that. So that's a step that you will never have to do manually anymore. And for every kind of vulnerability, you can create such a template. And well, you can then use that template in the future and run it on every single target that you're scanning in the future. Now, uh, Nuclei can do all of that, but there are other tools that can do that. But Nuclei is really fast and really efficient. Now, why is that? Well, uh, first of all, it's really fast because you have a single tool that is, that is handling sending requests. You have a single tool that's handling getting all this information and sending it out. Whereas if, if you could find two vulnerabilities and write two separate Python scripts for them, one uh, is going to be a Python script that, for example, checks if the .git directory is open. So you send the request, okay, handle all of that. Then you could have a second Python script that is going to scan those Amazon tokens, okay? It's also gonna send a Python request, probably with the requests library. And you have your two tools that you can run. That's great. They will work and that's fine. But Nuclei, since you don't have to write the logic for sending those requests, Nuclei can really optimize that specific part. So it can optimize all those parts that are really generic to every kind of script. And that's why it's very fast. Now, on top of that, it also has a feature that's called template clustering. And this is something that's really, really cool and that I don't think you'll find anywhere else. When you have two templates that both need to request uh, the main page of your target. So just make a get request to the home page of your target to scan for something. Well, if you write separate tools, then you're gonna make two get requests. But in reality, you only need to make one get request because it's gonna be the same every time. So Nuclei will find in all of your templates, in your full list of templates, it will find the templates that sent the same request out and it will cluster them. So it only sends one request instead of maybe 30 or 40. In this case, on the screenshot below, you can see that it clustered 330 templates and it reduced uh, 304 HTTP requests. And this was just a scan on a single target, but you can imagine if you're running it on a thousand targets uh, that that's gonna save a lot of bandwidth, which is, which is, which is really nice. Yeah. So uh, that is really what Nuclei is. But in reality, Nuclei is just an engine. Nuclei do doesn't do any of these templates. It's just an engine that allows us to freely do whatever we need to do. So we create our templates or we feed Nuclei templates, we feed Nuclei these targets, and it will go and run and do your scans. And that is really cool. It's really amazing. Um, 
but don't think of Nuclei as uh, a full vulnerability scanner because that's not what it wants to be. It wants to be just that engine that you can fine tune really uh, to whatever you want it to do. And um, there are a lot of people using it. And this is uh, something that people don't like about Nuclei. People are just running it in the default settings and just running it and hoping for answers. Whereas obviously almost the entire internet has been mapped with Nuclei with default settings. So you'll just find, get the same results as other people. Uh, because because they're kind of misusing Nuclei. That's not where the powers of Nuclei lie. It's powerful because you can customize it. And today, a, a big section of this presentation is really going to focus on that customization. How can we make Nuclei do exactly what we wanted to do? And how can we use everything that I've just talked about to uh, make products more secure, but also to keep them more secure and, and to work with that whole hell ecosystem here? So okay, that's what Nuclei is. And now I'm going to talk about Nuclei and, and how you can use it. And, and we're going to talk about two things here. We're going to talk about Nuclei for bug bounty hunters and then also Nuclei for organizations because Nuclei can be used on the blue team, but also the red team side of things. Just a quick question before, I think we're going to get into this in a little bit, but when you talk about the default settings, um, what, what are the default settings? Like, or what do you do to customize these templates? Do you need to know a little bit about the target web app? Do you need to know like the language it's written in or the stack or how do you, how do you move forward there from default settings into specific customizations? That's well, a great question. And, and the, the idea is that you don't want to know about, you don't want to have to know about what the server is running because these templates, they should be really standalone work on any target that you're going to be running. But the default settings here are, um, there, there is a repository where you can write templates to, or you can uh, make a pull request and, and, and put templates in that repository. And that's, uh, I think 3,500 templates have been, have been written there. And those are the basic ones that Nuclei will run with if you don't customize it. So it will run and check those 3,500 different <laughs> vulnerabilities, see. scans. And that's already huge. That's very important. And if, if, you've, if you've never uh, tried to do any kind of security sure. on your assets, it's definitely worth it running that and seeing what the results are. But uh, you can see where this comes into issues if, if, if everybody is running the same templates and scanning for the exact same things. So how can you customize it then? Well, you can run, you can create your own templates. So let's say there is uh, some kind of CVE that you want to scan. Uh, and well, there's no template for it yet. So you can write your own template for that CVE, put it into your nuclei and say, okay, on every target in the future that I want to scan, scan for this specific CVE. And at that point, you're maybe the only one who has that target or who has that template because you wrote it and you're the only one scanning for that specific CVE. Uh, in the same way, you could write something that is, is going to find an interesting endpoint that you discovered uh, on a, or if, for example, let's say you're on the blue team side of things and, and a vulnerability was found on your assets uh, and you just write a template for that specific vulnerability. And then you can reuse that in the future uh, when you make updates to your to your uh, product or on different domains to find that vulnerability in different places as well. Uh, so so that's where the customization comes into play. Uh, it is a very useful tool to run in its default settings, but don't expect uh, it to find crazy new things uh, because the real power in it, it doesn't lie there. It lies differently. It lies in creating your own templates and, and using that. And, and, I will have a big part of this presentation will be covering those templates and how you can write these things and what it can actually do. Because right now, right now it may sound really crazy because I've just showed only showed that that you can make one get request, but in reality you can do much more than just sending a get request. So so it's it's very powerful in, in that end. So and um, you mentioned that it was community powered. So I imagine even when you create a CV a template for a specific CV, it doesn't stay unique for a very long time. I think you contributed that then that template to the community. It's added to the default library and then it becomes available for everybody else. You, you can definitely do that. Uh, you don't have to uh, push your template to the community. It's not something you need to do, but it's, it's something that I would advise you to do. Uh, but there are various settings where you maybe don't want to do that. So let's say you're a company uh, that has a vulnerability on their internal network and they, they want to make sure that that vulnerability always gets found in the future. They don't want to obviously release the information about that specific vulnerability for them. Yeah to the public. So there are various cases, or let's say you're a bug bounty hunter and, and well, you're 
you yeah. find a lot of bugs by just writing templates and you make some money out of that. Obviously, you, you want to use your own words. It's your secret tool. Yeah. <laughs> You're not sharing it. Okay, <laughs> I, I get it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so it, it's community powered. So there are over 3,500 templates have been written that are open for you to use. And uh, that's just in the basic repository that that's, uh, Project Discovery, so the creator of Nuclei keeps. But there are also a bunch of GitHub repositories outside of there with over 10,000 more templates that you could also import into there. So a lot of people are sharing here, obviously, and not in every case you want to share everything, but sharing is really uh, the reason why Nuclei works and is such a great tool. So, so it's, it's at, at the basis of, of Nuclei. Uh, but okay, let's continue into, into Nuclei for bug bounty hunters. And for that, we obviously first need to talk about bug bounty and what it is. Um, because I, I imagine a lot of you already know, but I quickly want to go into a bug bounty and what it is. So uh, ten, 10 years ago, uh, there were hackers, just like there are today. Uh, there were people that were doing it maliciously, but there were also people just interested in breaking things. And I am, for example, one of those. I loved breaking things as a kid on the internet. Uh, but at some point you would find something and it would be like, oh, what am I going to do with this? I find a vulnerability. I can leak data from people. I can execute code on a server. What am I going to do with this? I was always terrified to go to the company and tell them because I heard these tales of people getting lawyers on them, getting cease and desists, going to jail for just reporting an issue to, so, to, to a company. So there wasn't really a framework to work with. So, well, in the end, a lot of bugs were found just for the joy of these, these hackers, but they would never submit them. They would never tell the company about them and they would try to stay ethical, but that didn't really work out. So at some point, some companies started to say, well, hey, uh, here is an email address. If you find a vulnerability and you want to disclose that to us, send an email with that vulnerability to us and, and we'll fix it. And that was great. And a lot of companies started doing that. But then some companies started seeing value in these people because these are passionate researchers that just want to hack for fun uh, what if we could start paying them for those vulnerabilities? So that way we can keep them uh, on our own company. They can find vulnerabilities on our own company and we can get more value out of them whilst they are also getting paid for that. So companies started doing that, but that also got, brought a new issue to light, which was people uh, reporting vulnerabilities that aren't actually vulnerabilities or fake things or begging for money and all of that. And that became a hassle for companies. And that's where bug bounty uh, platforms uh, started sprouting up. Because we, uh, as a bug bounty platform, we have our, our researchers who can hunt on companies. But we, in between there, we have our triage team and we have people checking the vulnerabilities, making sure that they are valid, uh, making sure that all of the communication happens correctly. And we are kind of the middleman in between there. Uh, and that's what we do. And currently, bug bounty has grown to an incredible height where there's thousands of people doing it and thousands of people running their scans and uh, thousands of people running nuclear scans because we see a ton of nuclear scans going in. And this is also where the issue of just running the default configuration lies. Because obviously, if you have a thousand people running nuclear against one target the exact same way with the exact same scans, well, they're all going to get the same results. They're all going to get duplicates. They're not going to be happy. The company is going to be mad because it just gets so much traffic. Uh, and that's why today I want to really talk about customizing Nuclei for your use so that you can run it in an efficient way so that we can prevent all just barraging the same website with the same scans, which is boring. You're not going to get anything out of that. Uh, so uh, how are we going to do that? Well, uh, with Nuclei, we can customize our te testing approach with our own suite of checks. So we see that as a red teamer, you're going to have your, your uh, checklist of things that you run through. For example, if you find a login page, you're going to run a certain checklist to check for SQL injection, no SQL injection, uh, admin, admin, password access, I don't know. Uh, there's a whole methodology there. Uh, and with Nuclei, we can kind of automate that methodology uh, by using these custom templates. Another really nice thing is that it can easily be run across multiple assets. So in Bug Bounty, very often we're dealing with, uh, well, I don't know, I think over 2,000 programs or companies that have things open on the internet to hack where you can get paid for hacking them. And they also have uh, tens of thousands of subdomains. So there are a ton of assets out there and we obviously want to run our scans on as many as them as possible so that we, we find uh, the vulnerability in each one. So uh, Nuclei is made for that. It's made to run across thousands of hosts in just a few minutes. That's where the strength lies. And this is also uh, 
The reason why it's so fast is because it has really optimized that lower level uh, sending those requests out and, and capturing the responses. It has really optimized that thing because that's what it does. You don't need to write uh, a new script that's going to make a, well, I say a Python get request with the request library and catch it. No, it has, it has optimized that so it can really process that as quickly as possible. Um, so that's a real big power. It's also designed to be easily integrated into other workflows. And I'm talking that people are doing this at an insane level. I have, I, I know of some hunters that have, uh, that are constantly running subdomain checks and updating their subdomains. And once they find a new one, Nucleus automatically ran across all of their tens of thousands of custom templates and they immediately get their results into their, on their phone so they can immediately check if something new pops up. This happens within minutes and, and Nucleus is really easy to integrate in those workflows. And if you want to go for automation, definitely use or try to use Nuclei and see if that works for you because it is amazing. Uh, and yet on the last one, you can easily automate your custom testing and you don't even know, need to know how to script. You only need to know a bit of YAML and then you can write your own templates and, and without having to write any script. And I, I know some people that actually, they used to be a, a, a financial advisor and they by accident, accident found a vulnerability in their software. Uh, just because they know so much about the financial world. So they know exactly how it works and they find like a logic bug in that. Uh, and they wanted to test it on, on like a bunch of other financial companies. So they wrote a nuclear template without having ever written a line of code, well, obviously with some help, but they wrote that and they started scanning it and they found like over $10,000 worth of bugs just through that simple approach of, of finding something and then writing a template for it and scanning it on different assets. Uh, so yeah, there's some great stories there. Obviously, you're not going to become a millionaire if you start using Nuclear today. That's not how it works. There's a lot of work that goes into that. But uh, it is an amazing tool to try out and to, to try your luck with. Okay. Zaki, uh, Zaki Xian in the chat was saying that it's a complex uh, tool to learn, but great to use. Uh, did you find that? It doesn't seem, you seem to say that it's easy. Where, 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 does, uh, where is it complex? How, how is it complex? Uh, I wouldn't exactly say it's, it's, very complex. I do get, I do get the comment. Um, it can be a lot to take in and, and, uh, but you can do very simple things with it pretty quickly and the documentation is great. Um, so, so yeah, the, definitely look at the documentation if you want to do things, but yeah, sometimes writing these templates and definitely if you've never used YAML, it can be a bit of a, of a hassle, but, uh, I, I wouldn't say it's more complex than, than any other tool out there. Um, obviously, Hacking is a complex thing. It's, it's not easy. Not everybody can do it. Uh, but but uh, I wouldn't say that Nuclear is like especially complex uh, if, if you're looking at across the whole board. But uh, if you've never used it, it can definitely cause some struggles. Um, but keep playing around with it. Keep running it. Keep trying to write new things, see if they work. Uh, and, and definitely start using it on some labs. Don't immediately go into the wild because then you're not going to find things. Um, find a lab, which can be hack the box, try hack me, your own lab that you wrote, whatever. Uh, find a vulnerability in there and then write your template that would find that vulnerability. And that way you can practice that and practice to check if it finds that the vulnerability successfully or not. Uh, so that way you're not immediately going into the deep part of the pool. You're still in the kiddie pool playing around. And then once you get acquainted with the tool, you can, you can go and use it in, in a deep end. Uh, B. Aravind also comments that uh, he heard that uh, Nuclear gives many false positives. Is that something that you've encountered by using the default uh, set of templates or? Uh, the default set of templates is pretty well, um, it's checked or it's, it, you can just push any template in there. And uh, so it's, it's, it's checked by the community. And I wouldn't say that Nuclear gives off many false positives. I would more say that it gives off more false negatives. So where there is a vulnerability and no vulnerability was reported. Okay. And uh, you did, you just mentioned that it's a lot of the community. Is there, who decides uh, which uh, template becomes part of the default set of templates or is that open to anyone and anybody can just add it? Of course, everybody can share whatever they want, but for it to become part of the default set of templates, how does that occur? I, I suppose I, I'm not too deep into that, but it's a, you make a pull request on GitHub. Uh, the pull request will obviously be checked by the community. It's open source, so everybody can check your pull request. And uh, I suppose once some, somebody from Project Discovery, so so uh, the people behind this uh, review it and they say, okay, it's, it's good, and the community agrees, then it will get added to the tool. Um, so yes, that, but uh, well, wait, uh, the, the question that I was just answering um, was about false positives. Many false positives. 
I think that's it's definitely not down to Nuclei itself, because Nuclei itself is just an engine. It's down to the templates. And if you write a template that is not very strict, it could give a lot of false positives. So I think that's fully up to the creator of those templates and which templates you run Nuclei with. Um, for example, I use it in my scanning. I never use the default templates because I know that other people have already ran it, so I'm not even bothering with that. And I write my own templates. And then you can obviously write them in a way that either give a lot of false positives, like if you're accepting a bunch of kinds of re responses as valid, yeah, then it's going to give a lot of false positives. But yeah, Nuclei by itself does not really. And j just a question about how Nuclei works as an engine. So you, you mentioned before, it's like kind of optimized so that you only make one get request or one post request. And all of yeah. that information and the response is then stored and parsed and evaluated against all those templates. Is that kind of high level how that works? Yeah, that's exactly correct. So it, it first of all takes all of your templates and it looks at them and it starts to see, okay, which can I group together, uh, which require a, a more difficult structure. Uh, and it starts sending those requests out and then it parses all of that internally in a very efficient way. Obviously, I'm not into the internals. I've, sure. I've not contrib contributed to Nuclei. Uh, but yeah, the power within it lies that you have this single engine doing all those things and you don't have to rewrite any of that code. You just have to write your templates and it works in that whole entire engine. Um, and so then, yes, you're, you're fully correct in that high level. Approach. And the bugs that you can detect here, like we're not talking about like, you know, sort of CVE style, like looking at version numbers and trying to match it against some CVE database. We're like literally parsing those responses to determine like, you know, OWASP top 10 like issues, input validation problems, session management issues, right? That That's what we're looking for here. You're looking at anything. Uh, you are you can definitely check CVEs with this tool. You can write okay. a, a template that would, for example, first make a GET request to a certain file where a version would be uh, disclosed. Sure. If that version is within your limits, then you're making a new request that is going to uh, check with a payload uh, and check what the response is. Is that response what we expected? Okay, that's vulnerable to that CVE. So you can really test almost anything that you could with any other script. You can test right. with Nuclei. Uh, you can really fine tune those templates to do exactly what you want them to do. And I, I will show that later that you can do so much with this because in the end, if we're writing our own scripts, all we're doing as well is sending a request, checking a response, mm -hmm. and seeing if it's vulnerable. There is no magic in there that any other script can do. You, you cannot go in between those requests. You're always still communicating with your targets. Um, so Nuclei just saw, okay, we're, we're using a lot of boilerplate code, sending requests, parsing uh, outputs. What if we just put that in one engine and you can do anything with it? Uh, and that's the story that I want to get across today is that probably, I, I don't know, but Nuclei is probably a uh, Turing complete. So you can probably write anything in there. <laughs> so it, it, it's really, really powerful. Um, but okay, uh, let, let's continue with the slides uh, for now. Yeah. Can okay, um, we skip uh, ahead uh, to the CI CD part? I think uh, you've gone through the benefit. I think they're good definitely, for definitely. Uh, for pen testers that organizations can use them as well. I think the CI CD part is where uh, um, we, we should go next. Definitely. Now, Nuclei, obviously, it's very useful for attackers, but it's also very useful for the blue side of things. The first thing is your CI CD pipeline. Um, you constantly, in, in this new way of, of developing code, you're constantly developing things, integrating them uh, and pushing them out to production. And it's it's a it's a not not something where you write your whole product, then you do testing and, and then you bring it out. Um, but that has some security issue uh, or some security things that you should think about as well, because, well, every time you write new codes, a new vulnerability could be introduced. And this is where I would definitely say use Nuclei in your pipeline, write your templates or use the default ones and and run it every time you push code to the production, make sure that Nuclei has run through it and that no issues were found. And that's something that's fairly simple to do, obviously, just a new step in your pipeline and that will protect you in a, in a, it won't find every vulnerability. That's impossible, but it will find the easy ones that can trickle in. And then, like I said earlier, things like the .git file that's accessed, that's something that can trickle in very easily but this would find that and, and other issues or API keys being leaked, this would find that. So definitely use it in your pipeline. And um, the next slide here is also about your continuous regression cycle. So uh, you build something, um, uh, you deploy it, you test it, you find a vulnerability. What do you do? Well, 
you find that vulnerability, you fix it. That's obviously the first thing. But then how do you make sure that that vulnerability never ever occurs in your product again? Well, write a Nuclei temp template for it. Make sure that the template finds the issue and then and, and integrate that in your CI/CD pipeline. So that way you have that template that found that issue that, that, you, that was actually an issue on your website. And if you ever uh, change that code again and that issue arises again, your template will say, hey, uh, I found an issue, stop, fix that issue. And, and, and that way you get notified of it and then you don't, don't make the same mistakes twice. Um, so and we see bug bounty um, companies doing this, but companies that have bug bounty programs, they are with, with every report that comes in, they create a nuclear template of that report and they integrate it so that they never have to pay for that issue again in the future because they know it, it won't be there. And I think this is something really powerful that a lot of people don't think about uh, when talking about nuclear. People only see the offensive side, but definitely use this on the defensive side as well because there is so much that can be done with nuclear. Uh, so if there's no questions about this part, then I will continue about uh, our first scan because, well, I've just talked a lot, but let's actually see this in action. Um, first of all, if you want to install it, there's it's a huge tool. There's plenty of ways of installing it. Go to the to the GitHub page and, and find out how to install it on your instance. Uh, but with that, uh, if you've installed it and you run nuclear dash dash version, you should see the, the version coming up and, and then you know that it's valid. But for now, let's get into a lab. And for this lab, I, am, uh, I got a vulnerable thing going on here, uh, which is a, a, a solar box, an Apache solar box, which is a free open source search engine. And well, perhaps there is an, is an issue in this. So, so let's run Nuclear on it. Uh, so I'm quickly going to go over here to my box. And once we're in here, we can see my instance up and running here. So this is my instance. Uh, well, it's just software, obviously. Uh, I don't want to manually check this. I don't know a lot about this. So, so let's just run Nuclear on it. And in this case, I am going to run Nuclear with the default template. So I'm going to say Nuclear dash dash target, and I'm just supply it with a single target in this case. Uh, obviously, read the help page on how to uh, get multiple targets in here. Uh, it's very easy. Just supply a list of targets. But in this case, I just want to run it on the single target. So I'm going to start running it here. Uh, and immediately, it outputs a bunch of things here. Uh, here it says that it added 22 updates in the last, <laughs> 22 templates in the last update. I think I updated this yesterday, so already new templates were added. It has 3,000 and a one, oh, that's a lot of output. There's 3,100 templates that it's going to run, and it clustered 522 of them, producing a bunch of requests. Okay, first of all, we have some output going back here. It detected a tech stack. It, it detected that AngularJS is running here. It detected Angular here through a favicon detection, I'll go up here a bit, through a favicon detection, it detected a jetty. Uh, okay, that's really cool. It also saw uh, that solar is exposed. So here uh, you see that all of these past ones have been informational. This one is medium because uh, the solar panel should not be exposed, so it found that. So somebody wrote a template that's gonna check for that. And here, I guess you only also get the version of it there. Uh, then there's a bunch of informational messages about security headers that are missing. Uh, that's obviously informational, but that's something that you might want to know about. Uh, okay, going down, down, down. Here at the bottom, we see that uh, internal IP is being disclosed here. So this internal IP is being disclosed. And we see that, oh, a critical issue was found, which is a log4j RCE here. Okay, well, that's uh, very interesting, obviously. Uh, how do I look into this now? Well, Nuclei gives us this URL here. And if we assess this URL, we see, okay, it's our local host, it's slash solar, it's slash admin, slash collections, and then an action here that is gonna be our JNDI LDAP string, followed by this, followed by here, our, uh, uh, a domain here, interact.sh. Um, Log4j is obviously an out of bounds vulnerability, which means that you don't directly get uh, output back but you get it in an out of bounds way. Nuclear can scan for that as well. It uses interact.sh, which is pretty much just you have a domain. If any requests get pinged to that domain, you can then check. So very simple there. But okay, it says that there's a vulnerability. Now you should never try, uh, you should never, sorry, my headphones are saying disconnected, connected, but uh, you should never uh, 
believe any tool for what it says directly, you need to check something manually. Uh, so let's let's do this in this case. I'm just gonna copy this address and put it into my URL bar here. Uh, this this time it's running an interactive SH. It's going to interact with the sage. I don't want to do that. I'm just going to use a burp suit here where I'm going to go for a uh, collaborator client. So this is just your burp collaborator, which is also an out of bounds way of getting information. Uh, and this will give me a URL as well that I will paste in here and replace this one just so we can double check that if I run this as well, that we will get uh, something back. So obviously this is out of bounds. So here we just get an error from solar. That's fine. Now, if I pull here, oh, we see that we actually got a DNS request to uh, to us here. So, okay, that's that seems to be really cool because, well, uh, it worked. Great. Obviously, this is still just uh, checking something. What if we want to try to go for an RCE on this host? And for that, I have, uh, let's, let's just use a, a GitHub repository here, log4j shell proof of concept. So, this just... Uh, is a proof of concept for, for, for getting an RCE. Uh, let's try that out. So I'm going to go into my log4j, uh, log4j shell proof of concept. Uh, here we have our poc.py. So if I run Python 3, OK, uh, that is doing something right now. Uh, now we can uh, use that. So it, it listens on a specific po on a specific uh, port here. This is the port that we want uh, our uh, vulnerable server to connect to. And, uh, and, and that's how we can use it. Uh, let me quickly uh, get this uh, for one second to double check. Just double checking something. Okay. So if I can share my screen once again, Right here, I have it uh, up and running once again, and now we should uh, start using it. So I can get a netcat listener because I want to listen for a interaction. So just using netcat uh, LNVP. L stands for listen, N stands for something, and V stands for verbose, and P stands for port. I'm gonna listen on uh, on this port, I believe. No, on nine thousand and one. And now it gives me a payload that I should just uh, give to this server. This is an IP address. I have to do a uh, I have config to check if that IP address is still correct. Uh, I'm running Docker here. That seems to still be correct, so that is fine. So then I will copy this and paste it into the browser with our payload from earlier. And then hopefully, let's uh, pray to the Oh, we got a connect connection back. So the demo gods were nice to us. Uh, so now if I run ID, we can see that we are root on the server. So <laughs> luckily, all the stress of this whole presentation is gone. Because <laughs> the are terrible. But just validated that this issue actually exists. This had nothing to do with the rest of the presentation. It was just kind of showing that Nuclei doesn't give false positives, like was said, or it, it can, but in this case, it doesn't because these templates, these basic templates are checked pretty well by the community. So you can be fairly sure that uh, you actually got some valuable insight out of it. Can I now? Right, but any any scanning tool requires this type of effort to validate yeah. scanning results. I mean, it's not yeah. a nuclei specific thing. It, this is what we have to do as security engineers: validate. One hundred percent, and this is something yeah. that we see so many people miss. We see on our big bounty platform, we see so many people running a tool. The tool says vulnerable, and I just paste the output of the tool into their submission form and say, "Hey, pay me a bounty." That's not how it works. Tools make mistakes and make a lot of mistakes. So always, always double check. Uh, if you've never played around with Log4j, that's going to be a little bit hard, but see it as a new way of learning something new. So, okay, now, now we've seen uh, Nuclei in action, finding an actual vulnerability, and this is what it can do for you. But this was in a very, very default setting. Can, can I just ask a, a slight detour? Can you pull up the Log4j template that Nuclei used to... Val to uh find this definitely vulnerability. definitely um okay i'm gonna find that on their github or we could do it at the end i don't want to interrupt your flow i just i'm curious no that's perfectly that. fine we can we can definitely take a look at that i have not done it so it's it's going to be super super interesting 
So uh, here you can see a repository, Nuclei Templates. These are all the templates uh, that Nuclei has. Now, uh, you can see they're grouped into a lot of things. So we'll have to we'll have to find it in here. I think log4j will be a vulnerability. This was in... Maybe it's in Java. Uh, could I didn't be in Oracle. It. I don't see Java. This no. was... Uh, maybe we, we can find it through uh, the find. If we find, look for log4j. Okay, 16 commits. Uh, what was the um, I, I what was solar? Okay, let's uh, solar. Aha, here this is the commit where that got added. But in codes, we can probably find this CVE. You know, that's an SSRF. This is there are a bunch of ah, log for J. This is probably the one. Not one hundred percent sure here. Yeah, I think. Okay, yeah, this is the one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, First of all, it gives us a bunch of information. Let's not bother with that right now, but let's look at the request. And, and this is how it found uh, a, log, uh, a log4j issue. This is all the code that had to be written, which is from line 14 till 36. That's it. So what it does is it makes a get request here to this specific path. So you can see it has the base URL. So that's what you mm -hmm. supply. And then it goes into the solar directory and so on. And here it supplies the interact uh, shell URL and that's all the code you have to, to send that request. And, and now all it's going to do is it's going to match for certain things. First of all, uh, it's going to match for a, a DNS interaction into uh, InteractSH. So it's just going to see, did InteractSH get a DNS pingback? And then secondly, here it's going to do a regex. And it's going to, uh, again, in that InteractSH request, it's going to look for the host name. Uh, and the reason it does that is because in here, you see that it calls, it tries to get the host name of this box in Interact SH. But that's just to verify, okay, we got a request back from the server. And that's all that that does. And then we have one more extractor, which is just gonna make sure that the host name gets outputted in the output. But really, all you really need is this part that I've selected right here. That's all you would need. Uh, the, the rest of there is just for it being nicer, but that's all you need to check for a log4j issue that we just manually, we had to find a Git repository that did it and whatnot, but that that's that's all you need. And I hope that this kind of showcases, so it was great to show this because this really showcases the power in, in Nuclear, I think. Um, so thanks for uh, saying that. Uh, so that, so the Interact SH, um, that is part of uh, Nuclei, right? That, that 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 I think it's written in Go too, right? Is that just like part of Nuclei as well? Interactive Sage is a, a different tool. Uh, I've no idea what who okay. created it or where it came from, but I believe it existed before Nuclei. But yeah, yeah, really it's a way of getting out of bound requests. Right. So this is a very specific thing. If you were to scan, for example, an SQL injection where it would just show the output onto the screen, then you don't need any of this Interactive Sage mumble that I'm talking about. That's just to get an out of bounds, uh, yep. to check for out of bounds stuff. Um, and you so don't have it. to worry about configuring it is really what I'm saying. It's kind of built into no, the Yeah, if you yeah, want to yeah. play it, will, uh, yeah. and it actually says it in the output as well. So yep. uh, it says you're using Interact SH and uh, it explains, so it just gets set yep. up and running for you. So you don't need to know anything about that. Uh, only if you're going to be writing your template, you'll probably want to know a right. little and bit about it. Zaki just kind of poignantly pointed out, it's just like Burp Collab. Uh, yeah, exactly. Interactive yeah. is it's pretty much just Burp Collaborator. Yep. Uh, okay, let's uh, talk a bit about templates now. So we want to hack our own way. Uh, and every template starts off with this same thing where we have uh, the setup. So we give it a unique ID uh, and we supply it some info. We can supply a name to the template. So that way, when you get your output, you can easily see it. You can set an author so you can obviously be the author of your own template. The severity because every different issue has a certain severity. We saw info uh, things earlier. We can also have definitely have critical things like that RCE here. You can then set a description, so information, a reference to a website. You can set tags, and these tags are really cool because then um, you could, for example, set a tag on a on a certain tag stack or on anything, and then you can uh, set up Nuclear to only only run templates with a specific tag. So, for example, if you're running on a mobile target, you could I have a tag mobile and all your mobile templates would have that tag and you can just run your mobile templates on a target. So these tags are really cool, but this is the setup. This is boring. We want to get into the real stuff. 
And the first thing is sending an HTTP request. It's very simple. Uh, here, there's a bunch of stuff here that you can do, but really you only need your method, which in this case is a get request, could be a post, could be head, could be uh, get put, uh, could be anything. And then your path where you will see this base URL, and that's the URL that you get from uh, running the tool. So that's if you give it a list, it will just go through the entire list and make a get request to, in this case, the login.php endpoint. Uh, you can set redirects, you can set the amount of times you're following redirects, you can set specific headers, you can give it a body, you can reuse cookies if you want to have some sessions. So if you make multiple requests and a session needs to be kept, you can do all of that. But the basic is just having a method and a path. That's cool. That's uh, obviously very great. But you can also send raw HTTP requests if you don't want to deal with setting all those flags. You just set a request and give it a raw request uh, that can come from burp, wherever. And that's also really nice. So um, just just qu a few questions that I just kind of feel like might work right here. Um, Prajwal is asking, why not just use OAuth Zap? And I think maybe just a discussion of how these work together, how you would use a proxy like Burp or Zap in conjunction with Nuclei. So as, as far as I know, uh, OS Zap is not really made to do this. It's not really made to... Uh, you, as far as I know, you can't give it a huge list of, of endpoints and just ran, run a bunch of scans on them really quickly. Uh, Nuclear is really only meant for automating, whereas Zap is also used for uh, intercepting requests, playing around with them, uh, doing certain things with them. Pro it probably also has functionality to send like 100 requests and then seeing what the times are between the responses, all of that kind of stuff. OSP Zap is really used for, for researching a target. Whereas Nuclear is made for scanning vulnerabilities on a target. Uh, you cannot use Nuclei to intercept an interesting request, change a couple parameters and send it back. It's not specific. Nuclei is more global. These templates are global. They should work on every endpoint out there. Um, so that, that's where the difference lies. And, and how you would use it is I would, first of all, if I'm uh, trying to, okay, let's say I have a, a company that I want to hack. Uh, I will use Burp or, or OS Zap and uh, intercept some requests. And perhaps I find an XSS somewhere. Now that access is really interesting. I can definitely submit that to the bug bounty program and get a payout. But then uh, I can also switch to Nuclear. I can create a template for that XSS, put the template into Nuclear and run it across all other subdomains of that target. Because if they make that mistake in one place, it will most likely also make it on a different place. And I'll probably have already run a subdomain scan. So I just give it all the subdomains, give it the template and say, see if this XSS occurs somewhere else. Uh, so that's how you could probably switch between these two tools because they're definitely not competing. They're not doing the same thing. I hope that kind of answers your question. Yeah, definitely. And you could use them to like, I mean, with Burp or Zap, you could literally see this raw HTTP request that you could then yeah. drop into Nuclei for validation. So just Exactly, a couple that's more... where the raw HTTP request is really nice. So. Right. So just a, another question that I f keeps coming up is, and it's I'm going to combine three questions in one. So Shalesh is, Shalesh is asking, does it support JWT authentication and then scan? Um, and then another question around, oh man, there's a lot of questions here. Um, does it support credentials? I just cannot find, oh, then Zachy's asking, is it possible to use credentials with Nuclei to reach? So I think maybe talk about how you could either assert authentication via a cookie or a credential or you know, how does it work with credentials? Yeah, so credentials are an interesting one. Um, the simplest configuration is where you for, where you have a website that needs to have a certain cookie set. So first you need to visit an endpoint that gives you a cookie. And then in the next request, you can use that. And in that case, you have the cookie reuse flag here. So first you, for, for example, make a get request to some kind of login, uh, which gives you a JDBT token, and then you can reuse it here. Now, I, the difficult part here is what if you have a website that requires authentication in order to access. Um, in that case, you're kind of flying outside of what Nuclear tries to do. It's, it's mainly for uh, finding CVEs and, 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 and issues, but you can uh, use some of the, if you go into the help page of Nuclear, you will find some ways to, for example, set a header for every single request Nuclear is going to send. So that way it will automatically add a header to every request. So if you have a website besides, uh, behind authentication, sorry, 
just set a header for every single request and every template because you don't want your templates to have to include authentication because they should not run on every website. Uh, so like unlike, a basic auth. Default credentials, obviously, um, but yeah. Yeah, so like basic auth, right? You could then solve it, solve that problem that way. Yeah, exactly. Uh, because that's specific for a certain target and not for a certain vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where you have to draw a, a line. Uh, Nuclear is made for scanning a certain vulnerability amongst a bunch of targets. Uh, whereas uh, credentials needed for a certain target has nothing to do with the vulnerability in specific. And if it has to do with the vulnerability in specific, uh, then you can solve it using this, this uh, way of writing requests uh, with the cookie reuse. Um, but definitely go to the, to the documentation if you want to read more about this, because obviously I cannot go into the details here of this specific flag. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, cool. All right, back on track here. Okay, uh, so yeah, we can send requests, but uh, what if we want to do some fuzzing? What if we want to brute force passwords? What if we want to brute force endpoints? Uh, well, that's also pos possible. We can do some fuzzing. So in this case, a screenshot here shows a raw request. We're sending a post to a uh, the root of the web server, and we have a file a get parameter, and we want to brute force a path, but we also want to brute force a header here and uh, give it a, a host name here. Okay, so then we supply some payloads. We say, okay, um, for the path, well, get this word list here, which is, uh, in this case, uh, this word list, obviously supply your own word lists there. Uh, and then in uh, in your header, you have, uh, you could supply a different word list. And then you have a, uh, a tech type. So this can be pitchfork, battering ram, something else. Uh, these are also used in burp, but check the documentation if you want to know exactly what they are. But I believe what pitchfork will do is it will use a path with all the headers that are you supply, then the second next path with all the headers you supply. And then you can um, use a matcher or something to try and match for something interesting, something out of the ordinary. And that way you can use do fuzzing with, with the nuclei. So that's also possible. Now, something else that a lot of people often struggle with is sending unsafe requests. So that's HTTP requests that are not valid. If you try to use curl to send an HTTP request that is not a valid HTTP, you will get an error and your request will not be sent. So uh, with this unsafe flag here, you can send weird requests like this one. That's, this request is definitely not valid. I believe this is checking some HTTP smuggling, uh, but also an XSS. Uh, I don't know exactly what this is doing, but it's not valid and it it, it works with uh, with Nuclei by setting an unsafe flag. And then at the bottom here, uh, I don't know if you can see it, but this is something that we'll cover uh, later as well. We have a matcher, uh, the type is DSL, DSL which is going to check um, something specific to the request. So if the request contains a body and in that body it has this script, then you have an XSS and that's how you can then match if your payload works or not. So unsafe requests possible. Uh, fuzzing can go really deeply here. Uh, you can do HTTP pipelining. You can do connection pooling, uh, where you put uh, where you don't close the TCP connection after every request, but you reuse the connection. Pipelining is uh, reusing one request for multiple requests. You can do HTTP smuggling. You can even go for race conditions, and this is something if you want to earn some earn some money, go for race conditions because. Barely anybody checks that. So if you write some really cool templates that check for race conditions on login forms or, or on, on various endpoints, I think you could, could uh, make, some, make some nice cash there. You could even send multi-request race conditions. So let's say you have a place where you have to first create an account, then try something, and then you get something specific. Well, you can configure that so that in your race condition, it will do all of those steps. So it's incredible. Check the documentation, how all of this works. but if anybody is after this talk comes to me and says, oh, well, that's not possible with Nuclei, I will probably just say, check the documentation because it most likely is. Because this even surprised me. I did not know this before uh, writing this talk, but I was going through the documentation. I was like, race conditions? Whoa, that's crazy. I need to write some templates for that for myself. So <laughs> that's something that I will be doing. But okay, fuzzing, crazy. Now, um, it can also run in headless mode. So uh, where you have a headless browser, so a, a browser that you don't see, but you can interact with it. So in this long thing here, this long uh, template here, you can see that it's gonna make a request to log in the PHP. It's gonna navigate there. It's gonna wait for it to load. Then it's going to perform an action. It's gonna click on a certain input and that input, you can find it in the HTML tree by going to HTML, body, div, div, form, field set, input. Okay, click that. 
wait for a load. Then it's going to type in the text admin into that input. Then it's going to click a second input. Again, wait for that all to load. Then it's going to enter the text value into that second input. And then it's going to click a third input, which is probably a button that says login. And then it's going to match for you have logged in as a user. So signaling that that was a valid login. This, uh, if you use this with your fuzzing, so then you can easily brute force forms. And imagine writing this in Python, right? You would probably have to get beautiful soup and you'd probably have to find these things and, and you would have to spin up your own headless browser and it would be a mess with Selenium and all that stuff. You can just write a 48 line uh, template and do all of that in Nuclei and it handles all the rest for you. So yeah, this headless mode, headless browser mode is incredible. Definitely a, a thing to check out for writing complex uh, stuff. But Nuclei can not only run uh, HTTP requests. You can also, um, for example, if you netcat connect with a target, uh, Nuclear can do that. It can send specific data. So in, in this case, it's going to hex decode this and send it to the host name. It's going to read something back. It's going to then match for a certain whatever. Obviously, it all depends on what you're scanning, but you can also just send raw data that's not HTTP requests to a target as well. Uh, you can also send DNS requests uh, for for doing certain DNS scanning. I don't know what, where you would want to use it, but it's possible. Uh, you can also, and this is something that a lot of people don't know, you don't need to do it on requests to a server. You can also scan a file. So a file that you locally have. In this case, for example, you have uh, your file. It's going to check for the extensions. Yeah, in this case, all or txt. Uh, and it's then going to extract Google API keys. So let's say you find a server that is exposing a lot of data. You just download that data locally and you just run some file uh, templates through it. It's going to find API keys, secret stuff, hidden stuff, whatever. Nuclei can also do that. Uh, and, and those are the main ways of, of finding, um, of running those scans, of getting data. Now I will talk about matchers in a bit, but maybe there are some questions about that. Um, then this is a perfect time. Let's see. Um, if not, that's also fine. Yeah, I, I, can, I don't. <clears throat> I think okay, we're good. perfect. I'll continue. I see that time is uh, slightly running out. Luckily, there's not a lot to say here. Matchers, well, they're just going to match output. You can find things such as status codes. You can find binary data. You can find uh, different words. So that's text, uh, the size. You can do regex. You can, with DSL and XPath and whatever, you can check for specific things and responses. Uh, and those are the matchers. Between these matchers, you can set, well, I want all of the matchers to match. I want to have an or relationship where one of the two has to match for it to be valid. You can make it crazy. You can do a lot of stuff with that. So, uh, yeah, very, very versatile. And then secondly, you also have extractors, which can extract data out of there and put it in the output. So that's pretty much just a matcher that's going to also extract it and put it in the output. Uh, lastly, or... or to uh, kind of get to the end, we also have out of bounds, which I just already explained with Interact and Sage. So that's possible. Um, something really cool. And the last thing that I will cover here is also workflows. This is where you have kind of a flow a, a, where things go through. Uh, in this template, for example, we're first of all going to do a tech detect. So this is a template that somebody probably wrote. It detects a kind of tech stack. If a Lotus Domino is matched in that, then we will uh, run this one, which is a Lotus Domino version template. So that's going to extract the version. And then we can have some sub templates on there. We're scanning if a version is something, we're scanning a specific CVE. If a version is a different value, we're scanning this CVE. So you can really create a nice workflow in there so that you're not, uh, and then the goal of these workflows is that you're not barraging a target that is not running Lotus Domino with CVE checks for Lotus Domino. So that way you're kind of limiting uh, that as well. Uh, so another really cool thing to do, but that's really all I wanted to talk to you about today. Uh, I would say go oh, smash those bugs, whether it's on the red team side, whether it's on the blue team side, let's make this world uh, safer. And well, I hope that you saw some value in Nuclear that you can introduce into your workflow. Yeah, I didn't realize it was Lotus Dominoes still live, but I bet there's probably a lot of <laughs> Yeah. So there's a couple of questions. Um, Laboratorio Hacker is asking, could you please show a template for a race condition? Of course I can do that. I will, uh, yeah, you can get another question going. I will quickly uh, find one in the documentation. Yep. And while you're digging around, can you use, Yusuf is asking, 
can you use Nuclei to fuzz a REST API without actually having the spec? Um, without actually having, uh, it's a very, know, that's like a question. magical, yeah. Yeah. I, I would say if, if you can do it with any other script, then yes, you can also do it with Nuclei. If you cannot do it by just writing a Python script or, or a, a script, then well, probably Nuclei is not doing magic. It's just a nice way of, of writing, writing your scans quicker and easier and faster. And right. It uh, looks like you, one more yeah. while you're still digging around. Yusuf is also saying it looks like the nuclei's idea of using templates for dynamic testing is simple is similar to using rules in SEMGRAP for static analysis. Sounds uh, kind of correct. Yeah, I see uh, that there's definitely a comparison to be made there. Um, yeah, into the details, I don't know many uh, details of, of of all of that, but uh, there, I mean, it, it's it's a tool that's does stuff and there have been other tools that also do stuff but i think that out of all of them nuclei does what it wants to do the best and if you use it for what it wants to do it's kind of limitless in, in what you can do uh, i'm quickly going to share my screen again because i have found a, a race condition here so let me zoom in so uh this is a, a simple race condition it's going to make a post request to slash coupons which might be an endpoint that's used in some tech to get a coupon and it's going to try to use the promo code 20 off. Uh, you can then set race to true, set the race count. So that's the amount of requests you're going to be sending in a race condition uh, to, in this case, 10. And then you just match if the response was a 200. Uh, if it then detects that multiple responses were a 200, signaling, uh, well, obviously, in a, in a situation where a 200 would mean, yes, the coupon code was supplied, and a 400 would, for example, be no, the coupon code couldn't be supplied because you already use it. Uh, then it, in this case, if it finds multiple responses with a 200 header status code, then you will have succeeded in your race condition. That, that's how simple it is. These two lines, race true, race count 10, boom, it does a race condition for you. You don't have to write all that complex codes to send requests quickly. Nuclei handles all of that for you. Uh, and here's also an example of a, a multi-step race condition. So in this case, it's going to make a post request to a certain amount of endpoints. I, I don't know the specifics of this, but you can uh, play around with that and do pretty much anything with it. But yeah, this is the basic race condition. It's very simple and very elegant in my opinion. Yeah, cool. Um, a few more last questions here. Uh, Have you ever heard about a bug bounty program asking hunters to attach nuclei templates to their reports? This is from Tufik. Uh, I believe that's something that some programs might ask. Uh, or, well, they cannot request you to do so, or they cannot force you to write that for your bug bounty reports. It's, you are not a consult consultant for them. You're not working for them by contract. They cannot ask you to do that. But I mean, if you want to, it's nice. Uh, I've, I've not heard of any of them enforcing it. And if they do, they should definitely write that in their program so that you know that beforehand, before you go and hunt on them. But yeah, that's something that is that it's being used by companies. Uh, in what exact way? Uh, I can't I can't really answer that, but it's definitely being used. Cool. Um, lots of thank yous. Lots of yeah. awesome, awesome. Thank you. Loved it. Thank you. Thank you. Let's make the world a safer place. Let's make great the presentation. Let's so. give you the, the message. Yeah. 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 Thank you that um do you have any last word uh rob i know that we've put all your links into our youtube show notes so if anybody wants to follow what you do I, I, you talked about the course that you're giving on or that you're starting on your channel on binary exploitation uh anything else that you'd like to talk uh, to leave us with yeah all the links have been posted so you can find me there uh, i do interesting stuff sometimes um, sometimes not but as well, if, if this has intrigued you to go in and use Nuclei and to write some of your own templates, uh, check out Integrity if you want to find some bugs and get paid for them. Uh, it could be a nice place for you. It's not for everyone, if everybody, but it might be the thing for you. So check that out if you're interested in it. I hope you guys enjoyed it from the comments. Uh, it seems that you have. So yeah, go use Nuclei and, and go nuts on it and find some cool bugs and make the world a safer place like we just said. So that's all. And write templates. Yes. And, yeah, sure and that... write them. <laughs> don't just use the ones, write your own for the interesting stuff. Perfect. Cool. So Nikki and I are taking a break for the next two weeks, I think. We'll see. Uh, oh, awesome. The slop's coming back at the end of April. Um, 
happy Easter. <laughs> we won't see you. Thank you, everyone, and see you next time. Thanks, Rob. Have a good one. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care, Bye -bye. everyone.